All right. Uh, now let's get started. Uh, thank you everybody for coming and uh, hope you uh, waked up a little bit due to this uh, technical issues. And uh, a quick introduction, I am Muzi. Uh, I am the API team lead from Growing Intelligence. Uh, we are a startup company that focusing on agriculture data. Our headquarter is in New York, but we also have an office, uh, office in Nairobi, Kenya. So today I'm going to share little stories we have been working on about the good, the bad, and the ugly about the agriculture data, as well as our journey of building this uh, platform that put all the uh, agriculture data together. So uh, when we think about the year of 2019, about uh, global food and agriculture, what's in your head? You probably already see those headlines on the news almost every day. So quick question. So raise your hand if you are familiar with uh, this China-US trade war. All right, almost everybody raised their hand. And uh, another question, like how many uh, people here have heard about the African swine fever crisis in China? All right, some of you. So for those who are not familiar with, basically uh, this African swine fever is a deadly disease that kills domestic pigs. And uh, China has been suffering from of this uh, since about like uh, September uh, from last year. And, but the real question is, uh, does anyone know what are the connections between this uh, deadly disease uh, of livestock in China with the rest of the world? including the US-China trade war and maybe even like the staple food price in Tanzania, as well as the planning decisions for those farmers in Argentina. So, of course, the answer will be uh, everything is connected, and let me explain why. So as you see, uh, China, US, Brazil is uh, at the bottom, and uh, right now, China produces about 60% of world, uh, pork in the world, and by far the largest consumer. Uh, since last year, about 30 to 50% of pig ha in China has either died of this African swine fever or have been killed to spread off the virus. So uh, unlike crop, which only take a, a one season to grow, restocking all those uh, hog population actually will take a few years. So what does that mean? It means three things. One, the global supply of pork will decrease dramatically. And two, for China, they will rely more on the imported pork instead of domestic production. And that means the aim for the rest of the world, the price of pork products, as your breakfast bacon, will probably <laughs> get more expensive. And also, uh, pig is soybeans, and China by far is the largest soybean consumer in the world as well. Most of the soybeans have been used uh, for livestock feed, and uh, if this uh, and also we know like uh, soybean is right now at the heart of uh, US-China trade war because China uh, uh, like imported most of its soybeans from US and followed by Brazil and Argentina. So now what will going to happen if this demanding uh, keep decreasing and uh, what will happen to the future negotiation in this trade war. And also for those soybean farmers in Midwestern US who already suffer a lot from this trade war as well as a major flooding earlier this year, are this going to ch change their uh, plant intention next year or maybe? And in addition, uh, China is not just seeking for a new meat suppliers, they also uh, start looking for other meat alternative for example, the chicken consumption is estimated to about to rise like 20% this year compared to last year. But chicken doesn't eat soybeans. Oh, wait. Ugh. Oops. All right, that's a that's a good picture. That's uh, exactly happening in my mind right now. But back to this. So chicken doesn't eat soybeans. They eat corn instead. So if China is going to consume more chicken in the field and it becomes a longer term, so what will happen to the global uh, trade about corn? And for a lot of African countries who actually rely a lot on corn as their staple food, what the price will be in the future? 
uh, yeah, so to answer those questions, you need a, a lot of data. And you might think this is easy because agriculture is such a, a data field industry and many, many data is available through uh, in, in public domain. But however, this is how people not find their information in their daily life. Um, let me explain why. So first, uh, agriculture data right now is extremely fragmented and uh, spreaded in hundreds of different uh, sources. It's not a single body that reporting different data. It's actually uh, like their, the whole industry is actually lack of uh, lack of like uh, consistent measurements and the standard. So for example, like uh, each sources may have different terms and definition even for the same thing. My favorite example is maize and uh, corn. Does anyone like know like maize is just same as corn in many countries. And also even in the same organization, uh, data can be structured completely inconsistent across different departments as well as uh, from like different time periods. So for example, there are some sources we work with uh, from China that basically it's a scan image on top of a PDF and uh, people move table like here and there from month to month. And then when you trying to analyze like hundreds, uh, like 30, 40 years of data, it get becomes extremely hard. Uh, language could be another uh, barrier uh, because uh, agriculture is global and every country tends to uh, report data in their local language. So we have like sources reported in Chinese, Spanish, Russian, Ukraine, et cetera. The translation is very hard because you now you need a lot of context and domain knowledge. And uh, not to mention about the issue with transparency. As mentioned, even though those data are publicly available, it's not very clear about like how they collect data. And also, for example, some sources like uh, US Department of uh, Food and Agriculture, they provide a data forecast and the yield model, but they are not exposing their inputs or methodology. So even you get the final number, it can be a combination of like surveys, local reports, uh, like uh, they also have like machine learning, but we don't know how the final number is generated. It could be a little like human touch in the end. So those are some of the problems we try to solve at Grow Intelligence. Right now we are building uh, like a, this central data platform that help uh, user have better access to agriculture data and help them generate insights from there. Here's our approach. So first, we took a bunch of uh, different sources uh, from national uh, statistical institutions to uh, like industry associations. And uh, those data covers not just the four crops like corn and the wheat, it also include other things like vegetables, uh, fruits, as well as climate data and uh, social uh, like social economic data. And then we build this uh, s standardized data pipeline, which is a pretty standard ETL, and which handles data harvesting, data update, and data back, uh, backfilling. But here, like each source app will, uh, from, uh, uh, from our uh, internally, will actually need to handle one of a few specific uh, problems. Like we mentioned earlier, like some sources reported in other uh, languages, uh, for those source apps, they will need an extra uh, translation layer. And also for other, uh, some sources that need uh, extra OCR to convert image to uh, machine readable data. Also for uh, those geospatial, it requires a lot of computation that transform those pixel level data into, uh, aggregate them into administrative level. And then we normalize those data into a knowledge graph. We call it like ontology, but it's basically a, a graph. And each node in that graph is uh, one type of entity. The entity can be like item or like corn, wheat, or a region, or the matrix who, uh, which measures different uh, item. And this uh, ontology uh, data graph also describes the relationship between different entities. My favorite example is so far, you know how many wheat we have seen in our system? The answer is two, uh, 270. You can imagine like there are so many different weeds like white weeds, uh, red weeds, uh, winter weeds, spring weed, and all the combination with different uh, like conditions and uh, to group, how to group those things together. It's actually a big hack right now. 
And uh, uh, before we started with uh, this normalization process actually involves a lot of like domain knowledge. So we, our internal analyst will be the expert who study the nature of those sources first. But recently we start experimenting a machine, uh, like AI approach. For example, we're using uh, neural networks trying to automatically map new data combinations into existing system. So uh, right now we have been integrated over a hundred different data sources and uh, mapped over uh, to over uh, 55 uh, millions of data series. Again, each data series is one unique combination of different entity. And uh, we have over 650 uh, trillions of data points in our system, plus uh, many more uh, pixels. Uh, so you can do a lot of things with all those data, especially when they're accessible through API. Uh, internally, we have been building a lot of uh, predict models uh, on both supply and demand side. So this is the machine learning approach that combining a lot of geospatial data plus the ground-based data. And uh, uh, since we're uh, learning more and more about agriculture data, we realize there are actually also uh, data gaps. Yep. Okay, yeah, I can speed up, but yeah. But for example, like a uh, uh, crop, uh, like uh, we have been uh, internally, we have built like a crop mask that for those regions that doesn't have the government to report data. And also you can compute like a uh, GD, uh, like a, cons a domestic consumption per capita through the existing domestic consumption plus a population from the other sources. And we also have like a, a web app, there's a UI portal for a user to, uh, to discover and uh, uh, visualize data. So this is a brief, uh, I won't get deep, uh, deeper into this, but this is a general model we have been uh, building internally to describe the general agriculture issue on both uh, supply and demand side and also the trade models in between. So uh, yeah, and uh, with the API, uh, our external users can also do a lot of customer applications as well. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of my big, uh, our biggest mission is to create the data transparency to the whole industry. It includes both uh, data accessibility and also data accuracy. So we open sourced all our API code on GitHub and uh, provide a lot of uh, document and uh, showcases to teach our user how to build their own model through Grow API. And uh, yeah, those are just some examples. You can check out our website as well. And for data accuracy, it's, uh, I will skip uh, the first few lines. The most important thing is like, unlike those public sources, we actually being very transparent about our uh, inputs and methodologies in our predictive model. So all those papers are accessible online. So with our API, like everybody can actually reproduce the model and the backtesting. So yeah, those are more uh, examples of customer applications. And uh, you can also even build a Slack bot or Alexa assist assistance with Grow API. So, yeah, that's our little journey about transforming data uh, in agriculture. And uh, any question? I guess we have three, two more names. Yeah, yeah, we have time. What questions do we have here? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question because you work on data, and some of this data is uh, public sec produced by governments yes. or administrations. What would be the advice you would give you would give government when they release data? Be more transparent about their methodology and also the definition of the things they're uh, doing. Yeah. Any, any other? I know, like actually, a, uh, like any slides from here can expand it to another like an hour, two hour talk. So, feel free to ask me. The technical or not technical questions? Cool. Uh, how did you, how did you solve the issue? For example, when you were dealing with. Uh, government information coming from China that was in these horrible, outdated formats. Do you have any examples of how something like that is converted to something more usable? 
Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Like we, uh, one big advantage we have is we are a super diverse team and we actually have a lot of employees that speak Chinese. And so we can read at least at the begin, like uh, the initial like a mapping process, we can actually have people from uh, like can read and understand Chinese that to uh, map the source and uh, build the initial like a pipeline to transform those like image into machine readable data. And once you build this automatic process, we also have a automatic uh, data quality check that to, uh, to see if this like data get updated like as expected and is the uh, data transformed like uh, from the automation process, is that correct? So it's like, it's not perfect, but it's something like we can, uh, like from time to time, we do see like a more special cases, but hopefully like with the time, it will get much better. All right, we have one last one. Oh, was there one? There we are. Yeah, I'm curious if you can share like who are your customers or maybe example of customers, for example, like our government who actually mm -hmm. sharing the data initially than customers of the platform. Yeah, sure. So our customer is mainly uh, like us, like those people around the farmers. We don't directly work with farmers, but we do work with people who sell uh, goods to farmers, like crop uh, company, insurance company, and banks who loan to the farmers. Uh, also the intermediary like uh, traders and hedge fund, and also people who buy goods from farmers like retailers and the food beverage company, etc. But we do think uh, with this public API, there could be some customer applications that directly like apply, like beneficial to like the farmers in more like daily basis. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank yep. you, Lucy. I will be around, so if you have any question, let me know, and uh, yeah.